Greetings, tertiary adjuncts of Unimatrix 01. Welcome to yet another OS Nerd video. This video is going to be on Next Step 3.3. Uh, Next Step 3.3 was released in 1995. It is currently the last edition under the Next Step name. The next main release was Open Step 4.0. Now this particular emulation is a Next Station Turbo Color, a 33 MHz Motorola 68040 with 128 megabytes of memory, and the main display is in beautiful 24-bit color. So let's log in and take a look at this. On the surface there doesn't appear to be many changes compared to the 2.0 release, however the first thing you'll notice is that everything is in colour. Not only the next icon, but everything. Next Step 3 really did embrace colour. Everything is in colour. Can't stress that enough. Everything. And it looks beautiful. Um, this release was the last supported version of Next Step. Um, it's still currently supported. Um, it is Y2K compliant with patch 4 released by Apple in 1998 or 1999. You can still obtain Next Step 3.3 from Black Hole Inc along with various bits of black hardware. Uh, the site's run by Rob Blessing. If you are interested in Next, um, I highly suggest visiting that website and seeing what is available. So let's have a look what we have in Next Step 3.3. Let's have a look at the preferences first. So, we noticed that the localization has been moved to its own preference pane. No longer is the keyboard type under keyboard and the language under general. We have everything under one nice preference pane. Uh, the clock preference pane is pretty much the same. Password preference pane is not worth showing. Um, the keyboard preference pane is pretty much the same. We've got rid of the, like I said, we got rid of the keyboard locale, um, but we still have the keyboard panel so we can see details on the keyboard that we have. Uh, mouse preference pane, um, the menu button options, the radio buttons are now stacked rather than side by side. Uh, let's have a look at the display preferences. So we have the dimmer and the brightness and the background color. Um, we have a separate preference pane for sound because by this time uh, sound was an external sound box. And we can set various system beeps. We have a font preference pane that lets you change the default fonts for various things. Then we have the menu preference pane which lets you change the default location of menus and create keyboard shortcuts. Now we have a new preference pane which is the services preference. And this lets you go in and disable services that you don't want and you can also see what services are currently available. And then we have the Unix preference pane that lets you set um, various um, advanced options. And then finally we have the power pane. Now this is the same power pane that was in Next Step 2.2. However, it is no longer attached to the boot device settings. Um, this basically lets you say, okay, um, I want the machine to turn back on after it powered off or after it failed, or I want the machine to turn on at a specific time. And that's it for the system, uh, for the uh, preferences application. Now let's have a look at the email application and see what we have. So the one big change to the active mailbox view is that the send mail button has been replaced with a compose button. Um, there are some other changes around the place um, with the menu layout etc. Um, I believe um, on under 2.0 you had a utilities menu that you use to get mail but here you, it's actually under the mailbox option. You go to mailbox and then get new mail. And let's see what we have from Steve. Welcome to Next Step, but we don't have his glorious voice this time, unfortunately. So that's email. Uh, uh, <coughs> oh, ooh, that's new. Ooh, cool. 
Okay, so this is Next Step 3.3 Intel running aside VMware. Um, I'm going to do the rest of the demo in this because um, uh, high definition. So where were we? Email, yes. Yeah, so we've looked at email and let's now have a look at Librarian. There were some changes between Librarian on Next Step 2 and Next Step 3. Um, for example, we now have these little icons over each um, bookshelf. Uh, what that means um, is whether or not it is indexed. If I go and have a look at uh, some of the system bookshelves, let's go into here and then developer bookshelf. We can see here that we have various things um, with just the orange circle above them, which means that they are not indexed, and then various things with the circle with the I in them that mean that they are indexed. So, that's librarian. What else do we have? Well, edit is pretty much the same. It's had a few changes to its menu layout. And this is its final form. The menu layout in OpenStep is pretty much identical to this. Um, but Edit at this point is a fairly well-featured rich text editor. And it's also a highly capable programmer's file editor. Um, should you not use Vi or Emacs or, or what have you. So, let's have a look what other applications we have on here. Okay, so we have the fax reader, which we've seen before. There's nothing new there. We have Grab. Um, now, Grab, I think, was a demo in Next Step 2.2, and Grab is basically a screenshot tool. So, for example, if I grab this window, you click on there, and you click on that, and then it takes a screenshot of the window for you, and then you can save that and, and do whatever you want with it. Likewise, you can also take... Um, grabs of the entire screen so let's go for time screen this should be five seconds except it was 10 seconds but oh well so yeah that takes a screen grab for you so um, pref uh, preview is still in there um, Print Manager is still in there, Quotations are still in there, Terminal is still in there, Webster is still in there. And that's it for the default applications. There aren't that many, really. Um, developer applications, there's a few. Um, now I have Enterprise Objects installed on here, so DB Modeler and EO Modeler wouldn't be part of the, def of the default install. File Merge is a useful tool that lets you compare files. Um, this is pretty much the same as file merge in OS X, and it's also similar to things like uh, KDIF on KDE and um, various other difference tools. As in you, you put a file in the left, put a file in the right, hit compare, and it shows you differences, and you can use that to select which file to merge in from with, uh, with revision control systems and the likes. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any files which um, have trivial differences in them to compare, so I can't really give you a demo of that, unfortunately. Header viewer is a tool that lets you view system headers, so let's have a look at uh, the 3D kit. Um, this will then give you documentation on what's going on, and you could select. Um, let's go for the shader here. Um, let's go for in it. Uh, get shader arg, and that would then uh, jump to the section in the manual, or you could jump to the header file and um, see it in context with the rest of the header file. This was actually fairly handy. You could set it up with custom paths. So if you had things like misc kit or a large project with lots of headers in, you could use header viewer to, to manage it and um, get access to, to um, the header files and uh, documentation for it. Next we have Icon Builder. Um, I'm not sure if this was in 2.2, um, but this is an application that you can use to actually create an icon. So that's pretty much it for Icon Builder. It's, it's a fairly simple icon editor. Interface Builder is pretty much the same as it is in 2.0. Um, so you create a new application, except this time around the interface is a, a bit cleaner. Uh, previously the classes, um, etc. would open in its own little window, but now we have everything under this tabbed window here, which makes things a bit easier. And I also prefer the classes, um, the class editor that we have here that you can use to drill down to classes. And then it shows you, um, it shows you what inlets and what outlets you have. Uh, so, uh, sorry, inlets and outlets, actions and outlets. So this is actions, and that one there is, let's see, do we have one? Yes, okay, so this is outlets. Um, outlets are um, conduits between your code and a 
interface element and actions are a conduit between interface elements and your code. So outlets will be, for example, updating a string and actions will be, say, clicking a button. Now, like I said, I'm going to do a whole series of videos on Interface Builder because it is sufficiently complex enough to warrant that. So next we have malloc, debug, and process monitor. These let you see um, what's going on memory-wise and process-wise. I'm going to skip Project Builder for a quick second and look at Yap. Yap, I think, was a demo. Um, I think Yap's been around since 0.8, just as an example, um, uh, with source code. Uh, with um, 3.0, the binary was actually provided as a tool. Uh, this basically lets you edit PostScript. Uh, you can preview the PostScript in the output pane. Um, I don't really use it that much because I don't really do much hacking in PostScript, but it's a useful tool to have. Now, Project Builder, as I said in the Next Step 2.2 video, uh, Next Step 3 is the one that completely changed the paradigm um, that developers used for developing their code. When you wrote an application for Next Step under 2.0 or what have you, um, generally speaking, uh, you were responsible for managing your own make file and header files and uh, object files and, and all that kind of stuff and you just used interface builder to create the nib well in next step three um, you had project builder and project builder um, let's see if I ha have um, any sources that I can load in it that are specific okay so icon kit I think might do um, do I have the source code for it though? Or, no, this is just the... Let's see, do I... Yes, I do. So, okay, so this is the project uh, the project itself in Project Builder. Um, this gives you a list of all the files that you have, the classes, the header files, nib files, images, etc. Um, you could set the project attributes, um, you could find stuff within the project, and more importantly, you could build, and you could set various build options, um, such as the architecture you're building for, um, the type it is, so in this case it's a palette, and then you just smack build, and it would run make, and you'd get the output in these two panes to show you what's going on. Um, the system itself had a whole bunch of makefile templates. I don't know if these are in 2.0 or 1.0, because to be honest, I have not done any development on those systems. But if you go to Next Developer and then Make Files, you have a whole bunch of make files that, that are included by make files generated by Project, um, by project Builder. And these can set things up um, for various project types. So for example, the app make file will set things up so you can build an application, library will set things up so you can make a library file, etc, etc. So that's Project Builder. Um, let's see if there's anything else under Next, nope, under, sorry, under Next Developer. Nope, okay, so let's have a look at the demos. So the demos are pretty much the same, um, except there's a few extras. Um, you have Open Sesame, which allows you to run things as root or on another host. So, for example, I can run bug, uh, bug next. If I go to services, Open Sesame, open as root. Um, I don't have the demo account in the, in the right Unix group to do this, but normally it would come up asking you for the root password. And then when you enter that, it will then load things up as root. So this is kind of like sudo. We have a CD player application because um, this is when systems started having CD-ROMs. So here we have Dark Forest, which is a tool that will tell you how much disk space something is using. Um, in this case, it's telling me the disk usage of my home directory. If I go to Demos, however, uh, Services, Size in Dark Forest, it'll tell me how much disk usage that directory is using. It's a really nice tool. Photo Album was a tool to support um, photo CDs. Um, the newest bunch of applications we have are Render Manager and Zilla. Um, now, I don't think I can do anything with Zilla because I don't think I have any tools that use it. So Zilla um, is basically a um, cluster computer engine. Uh, so basically using Zilla you can turn a whole bunch of next cubes or what have you into a supercomputer um, Each one becomes a compute node um, Which was 
tied in if you used Renderman to render a scene, you could use Renderman and Zilla to distribute the load of rendering a scene across N computers. Renderman was, uh, this, at this point in history, Steve had got into bed with Pixar, and Renderman actually is a Pixar creation, and um, it was provided on Next as 3D Kit. Um, so uh, you had a Renderman manager which lets you manage a render queue. Uh, now unfortunately there was no um, demo applications to actually uh, generate 3D. Um, instead you just had 3D kit and a very very simple um, oops, uh, a very very simple um, 3D kit example called Simple. Um, I haven't actually compiled this so I have no idea what this does. Um, but you had to have third-party apps to actually do any, any 3D work on the base system. So, I think, don't think there's anything else worth showing under demos. Well, I suppose there is this, which is a keyboard editing application. This basically lets you create a new keyboard layout, and then you can save that and then set that in the keyboard preferences or what have you. Uh, so that's pretty much it, really. Um, there are a whole bunch of things worth going into, but I don't think we really have the time. I mean, I could play a game of 3D chess with you, um, but, um, you know, that, that, that would be a bit boring. I'm going to lose, so I'm going to quit. So, administration tools. The administration tools reach their zenith with Next Step 3. Um, they are, in my opinion, very, very easy to use, very, very intuitive, and very, very powerful in some cases. So the first administration tool is Configure. Configure is available for black hardware, but it doesn't really do much because naturally um, all of the device drivers on the Next Step 3.3 CISC distribution media are for Intel. But on an Intel box, this lets you set the various drivers for hardware that you have on the system. So uh, we have display driver, we have mouse driver, we have network driver, we have SCSI drivers. And then we have sound drivers, and then we have miscellaneous drivers such as um, bus support, uh, floppy drive controllers, etc. Next we have host manager, which um, was net manager. Now I don't know if I have permissions to open it. Yes I do. So uh, again we have local host configuration um, that you can use to configure the local host. And then we have the ability to open hosts. Now there are two ways of doing this. We can open a, um, and this is going to store because Galaxy is not currently powered up. Um, that's a good way of me to show you how to kill processes. So if you go into tools and then processes, and then find the application you want and just click on kill. And goodbye. Let's try that again, shall we? So as I was saying, there's two ways of doing it. You can either open a specific NetInfo um, uh, directory on a host, or you can go for the NetInfo domain. So if I open up uh, Saratoga, uh, which is my Rhapsody DR2 Intel box, we can see here that we can change the, the, the host name, the, the IP address, the MAC address. And as usual, when, the mach when a new machine boots up, um, it will look for its MAC address um, in the hosts table in the NetInfo Master. If it's not found, um, the new machine will ask for a host name, and then it will look up the host name in the host database, and then it will send all these details along to uh, the client. And it also supports NetBoot still for diskless and fin clients. Installer hasn't really changed. Um, again, you can go in and under uh, next library and then receipts you can get all the um, the package um, receipts and you can either list their contents or delete them if you have permissions what have you so net info manager hasn't really changed um, it's the same kind of thing you can go in you can find directories and this is this is showing me local users on this machine if i open up the domain it will show me users that are in the NetInfo domain, and again, you can double-click on it and edit the various um, properties for that uh, for that um, entry. Netware Manager, um, 
I don't, want to, I don't want to enable it, I don't have any network machines on the network. But Network Manager basically lets you uh, configure the interface between NextStep and Netware, so you can mount Netware shares um, on the file system and access them via the file viewer. NFS Manager lets you do the same thing, but this time for NFS shares. So we can see here that this local machine has got two NFS imports, and it, um, sorry, two NFS exports, and has one NFS import. So if you go to then import to and select the top level parent domain, this then shows you all the NFS mounts that are um, specific to the NetInfo domain. So every single client on this NetInfo um, network will mount these directories under the net mount point. It uses an auto mounter, so in theory any new host that has an export um, will be mounted under net when uh, something requests it. So simple network starter is a little tool that lets you easily configure the network on a new machine, uh, whether or not it's going to be a NetInfo master, whether or not it's going to be a NetInfo slave or a client or a standalone box. Um, user manager hasn't really changed that much. It's just got rid of the, um, so if I go to use a new uh, local, it's got rid of the next login panel like thing. And there is also long form and groups. Editing users is a case of going to open and selecting. So, for example, um, if I want to edit this user, which is local, I can do that, or I can go in and edit the NetInfo users on the master. So that's pretty much it for the admin tools. Um, now, that's pretty much all that a stock Next system ships with. There aren't really that many applications or tools for the system. Um, However, there are a whole bunch that you can download and obtain. Um, we'd be here forever if I went through each one of these, um, so I'm not. But the one thing I am going to show you is this. Which was, um, this isn't the first ever web browser, this, this came much later. This was a release that uh, Tim did um, for posterity. He did a build for M68K, for Intel, etc. But this is, if I type in an address, um, actually I'll go in, I'll go in for uh, my main website because um, it doesn't really render anything as you'd expect it to be rendered. But uh, yeah, this is a web browser. I do have some original versions on um, the M68K version on, on running on the previous, but unfortunately it's not networked, so I can't really show you anything. And even worse, um, info.cern.ch um, or firstwebsite.cern.ch um, doesn't do HTTP 1.0 or HTTP 0.9, it only wants to do HTTP 1.1, so even if I did have a network um, even if I did have network capability on previous, um, I probably wouldn't be able to show you much because there wouldn't be many things that, that Nexus could connect to. So that's pretty much it for Next Step 3.3. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. As usual, if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to leave them below. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.